in the last section, we talked about the problem that can occur if a firm chooses an unrealistically high required rate of return for its residual income calculation. Economic value added, or EVA, is designed to remediate that problem. Basically, EVA is a variation on residual income. Let's compare the two formulas. Residual income uses after-tax operating income to measure the division's performance. EVA makes some adjustments to that after-tax income. In addition, residual income uses invested assets, whereas EVA uses adjusted invested assets. These adjustments are made to remove some distortions that can be caused by gap-based accounting treatments. For example, gap requires that research and development be expensed in the period in which it occurs, whereas R&D is actually supposed to have long-lasting value and income generating potential for the firm. So EVA would capitalize research and development costs and amortize them over the project's life. The other issue is the choice of the hurdle rate. Residual income uses a required rate of return that is chosen by the firm. And sometimes that choice could be unrealistically high. By contrast, EVA uses what's called weighted average cost of capital that is computed based on the firm's capital structure. That is, based on the firm's choice whether to finance its growth through debt or equity. Let's take a look at an example. We have some information about the residential division of drippy faucets for last year. Let's see how we can use that information to determine the division's economic value added. We see that the firm has five million $200,000 of invested assets. Those assets came from somewhere. They either came from the firm's mortgage bonds or its unsecured bonds or its stockholders equity. Therefore, the first step in using EVA is to compute the division's weighted average cost of capital. So we take the mortgage bonds that have an 8% interest rate and we adjust that for the fact that mortgage bond interest is tax deductible. Therefore, since this firm lives in a 40% tax world, that means that the interest on the mortgage bonds will reduce pre-tax income. So how much do those bonds actually cost the firm? They cost the firm 60% of the interest rate because the other portion is a tax shelter. Net, they cost the firm 4.8%. Similarly, the firm's unsecured bonds have a 10% interest rate. However, that interest is also deductible for tax purposes. It reduces the firm's pre-tax income. So those 10% bonds really only cost the firm 60% of 10% or 6% on an after-tax basis. By contrast, the common stock has a 12% return. That means that investors 
demand 12% each year, either expressed as dividends or expressed as capital growth. And that 12% return is not deductible for tax purposes, so it actually costs the firm 12%. By the way, this is one of the major incentives for firms financing their growth through debt rather than through equity because debt financing reduces our taxes and therefore it really costs the firm less. Now that we've figured out how much the financing is really costing, we need to determine the proportion of debt and of equity. We were told that the mortgage bonds are a million dollars. So we take that million dollars out of the firm's total assets and that tells us that about 19% of the firm's assets were financed by those mortgage bonds. The unsecured bonds were two million dollars. We take that as a proportion out of the firm's total assets and those mortgage bonds represent a little more than 38 percent of the financing for the firm's total assets. The common stock is 2.2 million dollars out of the total amount of the firm's assets. So approximately 42 percent of the firm's assets came from stockholders' equities rather than debt. Then we add up all of these proportions to make sure that we have accounted for 100% of the firm's assets. Now we want to figure out the weighted average cost of capital and we do that by taking the after-tax cost for each stream of financing and multiply it by the proportion of the firm's assets that is represented by that financing source. For mortgage bonds, we said that after taxes, the mortgage bonds really cost 4.8%, and we multiply that by the weight of the mortgage bonds out of all asset sources, and we get a number. We do the same thing with the unsecured bonds. Multiply the after-tax financing cost times the proportion that those bonds represent out of all of the division's assets, and we get a number. And we do the same thing for common stock, and we get a number. When we add these numbers up, that tells us the weighted average cost of financing all of the firm's assets. In this case, net across all assets, the firm has about an 8.3% weighted average cost of capital. Now that we know that, we can use it in our EVA calculation. So the formula for EVA is the difference between the division's after-tax income and all of its resources times the weighted average cost of capital. We need to take the division's pre-tax income and determine how much it would be after taxes. And we do that by multiplying times 1 minus the tax rate. In other words, if their pre-tax income is $1,040,000, they're going to pay 40% of that to the government for taxes, and that will leave them with 60% of that amount after taxes. And we're going to take the total capital employed and multiply it times the weighted average cost of capital that we just computed. Altogether, that tells us that the division generated more after-tax income than 
the cost of having those assets. In other words, the division enriched the firm by almost $192,000. So what are the good points about EVA? First of all, it has the advantages that residual income has. That is, it gets rid of the moral hazard that can be created when a firm uses ROI to evaluate the managers of investment centers. In addition, the adjustments to income and assets are generally considered to give EVA higher predictive value. And most important, rather than choosing a wishful required rate of return, EVA gives a firm benchmark by using the weighted average cost of capital. In other words, any division should at least cover the cost of having its assets and add something to firm profitability. The biggest problem with EVA is that it's difficult to calculate and many managers don't like it because of that. That's why they might need your help. In addition, like residual income, the result is not given as a percent. Most finance people prefer to understand performance in terms of percent because it makes it easier to compare one investment opportunity to another. And finally, there is not that much evidence that EVA works better than residual income for evaluating managers. Therefore, even though EVA may be better for investors to evaluate competing investment opportunities, most managers are evaluated based on residual income if they're not evaluated on ROI. Another issue when evaluating performance is how do we measure divisional assets? And this would be true regardless of the tool that we're using to evaluate the manager of an investment center. One option is to use historical cost. The problem is that if the division has had its assets for a long time, they were purchased with old dollars, dollars from a long time ago, whereas income is measured in current dollars. This isn't much of a problem in times of low inflation, but there have been times in the recent past when inflation has been significant, so this tends to overstate the value of a division. Another possibility is using depreciated cost. This is the value for assets that most firms use when they're computing ROI or residual income or economic value added. However, remember, as the assets are depreciated, their book value goes down. That means that our performance measure is going to go up, not because income is improving, but because assets are getting smaller. Therefore, managers who are evaluated based on the depreciated value of their assets tend to delay replacing those assets and that may not be what is in the best interests of the firm or its customers. Another possibility is to use the replacement cost of the assets. In other words, whether you replace your assets or not, I am going to assess you 
based on the value of new assets, not old assets. That, of course, would incentivize managers to replace their old assets because newer assets are more likely to be better income generators. Another issue is when to measure the assets. If we choose the asset beginning balance or the asset ending balance, that may affect when managers choose to buy new assets. And that may not be the basis on which we want managers to make that kind of decision. A better way to do it would be to use the average balance across the period. That way, it doesn't matter when within the period the manager chooses to improve or replace capital assets. Remember, when you are choosing a method to evaluate the performance of managers, the decisions that you make and the decisions that these managers make are only going to be as good as the information and the skills used to make them.